Good morning, City Light friends and family. Thank you so much for being here for our service today. We're so glad that you're here. If you could just take one second and fill out the digital connection card, it's gonna be in the comments. Just let us know who you are, where you're watching from. That's right, you can just click that link below. It'll take you out. You can fill the comment card out and be right back here before the service begins. We'll start in just a few minutes. Well, good morning, friends. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of our service this morning. We want to welcome you to City Light Online. Uh, I'm sure the last few weeks have been uh, interesting for you as your, your world's been turned upside down in a lot of ways. Um, and if there's one thing that this has done, hopefully, uh, for all of us, is that it's given us a chance to pause and to reprioritize and to reflect on where our focus has been. You know, I, I pray that God has used this time uh, to, to show you uh, the sufficiency of Christ for your situation. You know, if we're not careful, we'll set up these kingdoms around us. Uh, our, our kingdom of a career, 
or our kingdom of a, a church that we come and meet in or or of friends that we have or of hobbies that we have and and this this whole situation has really turned those kingdoms upside down so that we realize that we're not the king but that jesus is the king and so i hope that god has used this time uh, to help you reflect on and realize that Jesus Christ is King. He's the reason that we sing this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will uh, have our service this morning. Father, thank you so much uh, for who you are, Lord. I thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you that even in the midst of storms in life, we can praise your name. Uh, Lord, I just thank you that even though our circumstances change, that Jesus Christ never changes, that you are our rock and our fortress, our deliverer, Lord, and that uh, through you we can find true joy and true, uh, true faithfulness uh, because of who you are. Lord, I just pray that today we would lift up our hearts, lift up our voices, let you work in, in our lives today as a result of uh, being here uh, through this online service. Lord, just work in our lives today, and we pray that you would get the glory. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. this life inside me. One name above all names. Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus. There's a reason for this hope. There's a reason for this peace that I know. One worthy of all of your grace each day I will bow and bless your name Jesus I thank you Jesus I will lift my hands up I will raise my voice high I will shout of your love till the day that I die everything that I have all my worship I bring final breath has left these lungs. I'll forever be with you. Where the song goes on and on. So I will lift my hands up. I will raise my voice high. I will shout of your love till the day that I die. Everything that I I live, you're the reason I sing. 
seems like lately, every single day, we're waking up to new bad news. And that can get very depressing. And that can get very dark. If we're not careful, we can fall prey to the darkness that comes because of that negative uh, news that we hear every single day. But something that never changes is the mercy of God towards us. The Bible says that God's mercies are new every morning and that his love is stronger than darkness. Uh, and I'm so grateful for a God that loves me enough uh, that can shine light through the darkness that I, I, uh, I see every single day, that can shine truth into my heart, that can encourage and lift me up because of the mercies that he gives me new, new every single morning. Um, and I hope that you, every day that you get up, experience the new mercies of God uh, for you every single day and that those mercies shine light into what can be a very dark time uh, and that you rest and abide in the mercies of God in your life.
great job singing. I could hear you from my couch. You did a wonderful job uh, with that song. We're so glad that we can meet like this together. We, I know we want to be at church so bad, but so thankful for the technology that we have, that we can gather together all at the same time and be encouraged around the singing of the truth of God, praising His name, uh, and then listening to the preaching of the Word of God and getting into God's Word and what it has for us. All year long, we've been on this subject of being gospel-centered. That is salvation from my everyday life. And right now, if we have God's design, those, the circles that we've talked about a lot, God's design, brokenness, and down here in the gospel, we want to kind of dive down deep into this gospel circle with something over the next few weeks that I've entitled Gospel Growth. Discover the distance between God and me. And this is something that is so important to us that we want to be growing in the gospel and understanding uh, of the word of God. Uh, and I know we go, oh, I know the gospel. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, rose again, and that's all I'm trusting in for my salvation. Praise the Lord. Yes, that is justification. I was saved from my sins. Praise the Lord. We know about glorification. That is saved one day in the future when I get to heaven and I'm like Christ and I'm made eternal and I, my sinfulness is gone uh, and I get to be with God and, and love ones that have gone before. Yes, we know that too, but we're talking about this gospel-centered aspect of right now, today in my life, sanctification, and we want to grow in our understanding of this. And as I grow, I'm going to notice a difference between God and me, and that's kind of what we're going to dive into today. Here's really the subject. If I kind of summed this story in Luke 7 and summed it all up for us, it would be this, is that self-righteousness keeps us from loving God with all of our heart. That's God's design for us, is that we would love Him and love others. But sin it leads us into brokenness, where we try to get our own needs met, where we're very self-centered, self-focused, self-fulfilling, and many times self-righteous. And so in our story today, we're going to see how Jesus confronts self-righteousness and really uh, kind of gives us a comparison between the two, one that's righteous because of Christ and one that's righteous because of self. We're going to look at Luke chapter 7 and verse 36 in just a second. You know, the older I get, the less I know. The older I get, the less I know. Uh, but, you know, as, as an older person, uh, every once in a while, I get insulted by a young person when they try to teach me something that they think I don't know. And it's one thing to come from a 25-year-old. It's another thing when it comes from your 4-year-old. Just, just yesterday, I was uh, helping Cadence uh, wash her hands after she had eaten something that got her all messy. And put her hands up there. I pumped the soap on. And she said, Daddy, that's not soap. I said, yes, it is, baby. It's dish soap. Daddy, that's not soap. Mommy never used that soap. And she began to lecture me about the right way to use soap and how to apply it and what, what, what needs to happen and what mommy does. I'm sure none of your dads have ever, you dads have ever experienced that. Um, but I tried to explain her. It is soap. It's a different kind of soap. And I don't normally use a soap, but it's just, it's, you know, and, and you try to explain the logic to it. And she goes, well, Daddy, I am not a dish. Um, and I, yeah, I know you're not a dish, but this is, uh, and, and it was like, enough already. Uh, you know, I, sometimes uh, I can't wait, you know, I, I think, I, I can't wait until you have a 10-year-old. I can't wait until you have a 5, 4-year-old, uh, and they can teach you how to make macaroni uh, and cheese. You know, we're fully aware of the fact that as they grow, they're going to get a little older, and one day they'll become aware of all that they didn't know, or how much how awesome their parents were, or how smart their parents were. At least I could get a, maybe a thumbs up for that here on, on Facebook this morning. Have you ever done something or said something as an adult, uh, and it reminded you of your mom or your dad? And you thought, oh no, oh no, they were right. You know, like I don't want to admit it, but man, they were right. Or, oh, now I get it. That's what they meant. And, and it's really no different as we grow in the gospel. Uh, we enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ uh, with, you know, just far separated from him. Uh, and a lot of issues going on and a lot of things we don't know. But as we receive Christ our Savior and the Holy Spirit comes inside of our life, he begins to teach us and to show us things. And so as we grow as a Christian, there should be many times for the rest of our life. In fact, the Bible says in eternity that God will reveal the riches of his grace. So for, even for all eternity, God is so incredible. God is so amazing. And for all of eternity, we're going to go, oh, I get it. 
And as we grow in our understanding uh, of the gospel, one of the signs that we're getting it will be that we discover the distance between God and me. And this distance, this discovery, uh, will produce a greater love for God, a greater glory for God, uh, and 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 a greater praise in our life for God and who He is and what He's done in our life. And I know this sort of seems elementary, but Honestly, it's a little more challenging than you might think because we are we tend to think pretty highly of ourselves. Like I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm impressive. And in Luke chapter seven, Jesus brings uh, it, it, it brings a story. He brings a story into a dinner party that he's at that kind of highlights mankind's tendencies for self righteousness, but also the correct we response we should have when we're confronted with jesus christ and who he really is so in luke chapter 7 and verse 36 we pick up this dinner party that's uh, interrupted by a guest who's not socially acceptable but she doesn't care because she's there because jesus is here look at verse 36 and one of these pharisees desired him that he would eat with him and he went into the pharisee's house and he sat down to meet and behold a woman of the city uh, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was at meat in the, in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment or a flask of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Here Jesus is invited in as a guest. He sits down at this table. It's a little horseshoe type uh, of a scenario is what they would have sat down in most likely. They reclined on their left elbow and then that made it able to eat with their right hand. It wouldn't have worked for me. Uh, I'm left-handed. But, uh, and as they reclined at this very low table, their feet, uh, th- their feet would be out this way. And so that makes sense as they're eating and, and this lady knows Jesus there. She comes in and she has this precious, valuable ointment she comes to the feet of Jesus. She's crying. She's tear, teared up. And the Bible says that the, tear, that the tears she's crying, they fall on Jesus' feet. And she begins to wash Jesus' feet with her hair. And then she takes this ointment and she pours it uh, on him and she's kissing his feet. Uh, and you say, what is going on here? Well, this would be a, a typical greeting when a, a special guest, an important person, uh, someone who's loved or valued would come to your home for dinner or for a meal or celebration. This would be the greeting. They come in their sandals and their dusty feet. Uh, and one of their servants, uh, you have a servant, wash their feet. Uh, and then they would be dried off. Uh, they would kiss each other on the, on the cheek with a greeting. Uh, and then a kind of an ointment or a spice or something was kind of placed on their head or their shoulder uh, to kind of help them smell good, to freshen up uh, before their big event. So this is what's happening. This lady comes in. The, Bi- the Bible describes her as a sinner. Uh, the woman in the city, she's a sinner. Uh, she was a prostitute. Uh, and she had, uh, she was, you know, socially was unacceptable man she's an outcast because of the way that she lives her life and the and the, the choices that she's made in luke 7, in 7 verse 39 the bible says and when the pharisee had bi- that had bidden him saw it he spake within himself saying this man if he were a prophet speaking about jesus would have known who and what manner of woman uh, this is that toucheth him for she is a sinner in verse 40, and Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. So here's this, this is happening. This lady is washing his feet and kissing his feet and, uh, and she's crying. Uh, and the, the Pharisee, we're going to later find out in a second, is named Simon. He's thinking, man, if Jesus was a prophet, if he really was sent from God, if he was someone important, he would know who this lady is. He would understand. He would get it. He would connect the dots. And he wouldn't let her touch her. He wouldn't come close to her because she's unclean. And, and he wouldn't want to be unclean. I don't know that this Jesus is really who he says to be or who people say he is because he clearly isn't getting this. He doesn't care. And, and it's an, it was very important to Simon the Pharisee to not be associated or connected or touch people that lived in this kind of lifestyle. In verse 41, the story picks up that you know, Jesus says, hey, can I, can I tell you something, Simon? He says, sure, go ahead, tell me. So in verse 41, he tells them, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors, and the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, uh, Jesus says to Simon, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most, and he said to him, 
Thou hast rightly said. Can you imagine this? Jesus just said, hey, I want to tell you a story. Uh, and here's the story. Two guys owe money. One's 50 pence and one's 500 pence. 50 pence was like two months worth of work. You kind of think about your paycheck for two months. That's how much you owe. The other guy owed 500 pence. And that was like almost two years uh, of work. And, and here's these guys that both owe, but neither can pay the money. And so uh, the creditor forgives both of them. What an incredible situation that would be uh, to have your debt of two months worth of work paid for, gone, or two years worth of work. Imagine someone just walking up and saying, eh, you owe me this. Your mortgage company comes in and says, you know, we owe this, but just don't worry about it. Man, what, a, what an incredible uh, thing uh, that would be. And so Jesus asked Simon, he says, Simon, who loves the creditor more? And he said, well, I suppose it's the one uh, who was forgiven the most. He said, that's exactly right. So in verse 44, the story continues. Then he turns to the woman and he says to Simon, See this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. In verse 46, And my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman uh, hath anointed my feet uh, with ointment. These were uh, expressions of affection that this lady had uh, for Jesus Christ. The, the cleaning of his feet, uh, the kissing of his feet, the anointing of the oil. He said, you're special, you're valuable, you're important, you're irreplaceable. And he, and he calls Simon out in the story. He says, look, you didn't do this. You know, you could have, you could have gave me feet, uh, water for my feet, uh, but you didn't. You could have greeted me with a kiss, but, but you didn't. You could have anointed me with oil. This would have been someone that you respected, someone that you appreciated, someone that you loved, but you did not. And it's because of his self-righteous. We're going to unpack that in just, just a second. But here's this lady who has just come in, and she's crying. She's thankful. She loves Jesus, and, and she's expressing this love. Something has happened in this lady's life connected with Jesus, and here she is showing uh, with, with great social risk She's come in, and she's made these expressions of her love for him. And so she, he says in verse 47, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which were many, are forgiven, for she hath loved much. Now that's not, uh, because she loved, I'm forgiven her sins. It's not a causal for, uh, but it's an evidential for that says, uh, and, and she, her sins have been forgiven, and the evidence is, look at her expressions of love. Look at her expressions of compassion. Look how much she loves me because I have forgiven her. And he says, but to whom little is forgiven, the same love of little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat with him, they began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Well, what an incredible story here that where Jesus is going to highlight for Simon and for us the distance between God and me. And it's, and it's done between these two people. Here's this harlot that comes in and she's thankful because she's been forgiven, because she's been saved. No doubt she's heard Jesus speak and put her faith in Jesus as being the Messiah, as being God, and her sins uh, are, are forgiven. She loves Jesus because Jesus has done something for her that she couldn't do for herself. And then there's Simon who, who kind of ignored Jesus when he came in, invited him to his house, but forgot or didn't care uh, to wash his feet, to anoint him with oil, to greet him with a kiss. He did none of that because probably thought, yeah, I'm better than Jesus, or we're equals, or it's not a big deal, or, uh, or really he was there maybe for the wrong motives, try to trick him and get him to say something wrong so that they could uh, prosecute him. And, and so uh, here we have this story, and Jesus tells about these two people. The Bible tells about these two people. Jesus shared this story with them. But, but let me ask you this question. Who are you in the story? Would you kind of agree, would you, would you identify with Simon, or would you identify with the sinful woman? Uh, you know, before we grow in our understanding of the gospel, uh, in brokenness, uh, and in God's design, uh, it's no doubt that we're a lot like the Pharisee. We kind of maybe think, especially uh, if we uh, have grown up in Christianity, if we were saved at an early age, and we've done all the right things we do, you know, our life is been uh, set up for us really by our parents many times when we don't do this I never did that I've never experienced that over there I've never been a part of that and we just kind of say man I'm a I'm a I'm a pretty good person do you identify with Simon or would you identify with a woman you know if, if you would identify with Simon if you go you know what not that bad I'm pretty good I mean I'm not perfect and I do some things wrong but the truth is I'm not like that person there's a lot worse people in the world if if that's what you think 
then I think that we should understand in our hearts that we identify more with Simon and that there's a, maybe an issue of self-righteousness in our life. But when we grow in our gospel, we become more like the lady who anointed Jesus' feet with oil. The point of the story is that our love for God grows as we discover the distance between God and me. And so does our faith, and so does our appreciation and His glory, and our ability to glorify Him. When we begin to discover inside of the gospel, there is a great distance between God and me. And, and there's not a great distance between me and, and every other sinner in the world. The truth is, is that Simon uh, thought he was self-righteous. He kept the rules he had correct standards. On the outside, he was flawless. But as Jesus told other Pharisees, inside, he was full of dead men's bones. You know, fresh painted a tomb that's full of bones, dead bones, stinking bones, rotten bones. Your lips, they're close to God, but your heart is far from God. And what's worse, he didn't even know it. M many times we can be like that, can't we? Man, we, we, we get on a roll, we're doing some good, we don't do this, we don't that, we see other people, and they go, oh, look at them, oh, I can't believe, how dare they? Uh, and, and man, we start to think something of ourselves. We, we believe that God loves us because of how we perform. We believe God loves us because of the things we don't do and things that we do. And we understand the only way we deserve the love of God is because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Instead of finding righteousness in Christ, we are prone to establish our, our, our own righteousness. Instead of finding security and significance in Christ, that we attempt through self-promotion uh, to get our needs met, our security and significance met uh, through the recognition and the praise of other people. Now this morning, I just want to give you, as we kind of consider, what, what does this story have to do with me? How, where am I at in the story? What is it that I need to learn here? And I want us to see four rules of self-righteousness. Now, there could be many more. There are a number more in this passage. If you see one, I'd love for you to comment below and say, oh, when you're self-righteous, this is what it looks like. This is what you do. This is the attitude that you have. I've really kind of taken the, the main four here that I think we can get in our time and that'll be a help to us. And I, I just want to uncover these for us this morning. Four rules of self-righteousness. Number one, self-righteousness find significance in self-promotion through criticism and comparison with others. Self-righteousness finds significance in self-promotion, promoting myself through criticism and comparison with others. I'm better. They're worse. <laughs> well, at least I didn't. I would never. Can you believe what they did? It's like the Pharisee who prayed, uh, Lord, I'm thankful that I'm not like that guy. You know, I, I tithe. He doesn't. I, I fast. I, I do this, and he doesn't. That's just an incredible story in the Bible. Where you imagine someone standing, hey, brother, would you pray? And he stands up and says, Lord, thank, aren't you glad I'm here today, God? Aren't you impressed with me? I do this. Matt doesn't do that. <laughs> Could you imagine hearing a prayer like that? It would be like, what in the world uh, is going on? This is the attitude of Simon. This is the attitude of the self-righteous person. Uh, we see it in verse 39 where he says, man, if, if, if this guy were a prophet, he would know who this lady is and he wouldn't touch her. He wouldn't let her go on because <clears throat> she said, of course he'd eat with me. You know, of course he would hang out with me. Of course I'm clean because I do this, 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 and this. But this lady, she's a sinner. She's wicked. She's done a lot of things. Uh, and, and Jesus is no better because he doesn't even know who she is. And he's kind of connecting with her and, and associating with her. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, we're told that comparing themselves among themselves, they were not wise. Why? Well, because the, the comparison should never made be, hey, I'm not as bad a sinner as him. What does that say? The, the fact of the matter is the Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. There's a great distance between God and me. And it's important that we remember that even if we're having a good day, you know, even if we've kept our nose clean, even if we're on a, a roll spiritually and we're, we're living in God's design and, and, man, we're just filled with the Spirit and we're just nailing it, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand, take heed, lest he fall. It's important that we remember always with a spirit of humility that anything we accomplish is because of the, the grace of God and the work of God and that because as long as I'm in this flesh, I am capable of the worst of sins. 
When the gospel grows, uh, so does my awareness of my sin. Simon was not aware. Uh, He was self-righteous and promoted himself and found a significance in being better than other people. But when the gospel grows, we begin to see we're not better than other people. We're all sinners. We all fall short. Like Paul said in Romans 7, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He, he told Timothy <clears throat> in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 15, uh, God came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6, 5 said, as he got a vision of who God was and began his, his, the, the, the gospel began to grow in his life, he said, woe is me, for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He got it. He, the gospel began to grow in his life. He got a real vision of who God was and who he was uh, by comparison. I wonder sometimes, do we attempt to gain security and significance through criticism and comparison? Or are we patient, empathetic, understanding with others and their failures because you're aware that we're sinful too? And we're patient with others and kind to others and extend grace to others because we get it. I'd be that way too if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. And, uh, and I am like that many times because I don't trust that God is enough for my life. Uh, and so <clears throat> self-righteousness finds significance in self-promotion through criticism and comparison to others. Secondly, self-righteousness thinks less of God and more of themselves. In verse 40, he says, Simon, can I, can I tell you something? And he says, yes, yeah, say on. I wonder what Simon thought Jesus was going to say. Simon, this is the best meal ever. Simon, you're so incredible. Simon, what should we do with this lady who keeps touching my feet? What, you know, what's the problem? Simon, help me figure this situation out because we, uh, you know, don't want to, don't want to, we don't want to be around her. But here we see uh, that Simon is told a story by Jesus Christ. And, and he gives the story, the two guys owe debt, they're both forgiven, who loves more? And Simon nails the question. He gets it right. Hey, I believe Simon's going to pass all the religious tests. He knows all the answers. He knows the longest name in the Bible. He knows the capital of Jerusalem is, or of Israel is. Uh, and um, he's, he's book smart, but he's street dumb. He, he knows uh, the answers, but he doesn't get the question. He, he's missing out on the point of it all. I imagine that Simon thought he was a gift to God. He thought he pleased God or impressed God. His significance came from his performance and, for, and from pretending like he had it all together. And that's the crazy thing. It's, it's self, which is sinful, depraved, wrong, self-righteousness. It's kind of a, those, those things don't go together. It's kind of an oxymoron. It's, it's a pretend thing. It's not, even, it's not even real. It's not even possible. And that's why the Bible says that God showed his love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My friend, maybe you're watching this today and you don't know for certain your sins are forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. Maybe you feel like there's a disconnect between you and God. And here many times is what the disconnect is, is that people try to make themselves righteous. They, they think that by doing a bunch of good things that they'll gain favor with God. Or that somehow God will uh, forgive the bad they did because of all the good they did. That's self-righteousness. And there's not enough good deeds in the world to undo all the wrong we've done. To, to forgive the sin that we've done, the only way someone is forgiven, the only way that someone is made right with God is through righteousness that comes through Christ. And we, wanna, we don't want to be self-righteous. We want to be, be in Christ righteousness. We want to grow in our understanding of the gospel. Uh, and, and when we do that, we respond like Peter did in Luke 5, 8, when, when, when the story when Jesus said, throw your net on the other side, he threw it out and caught a bunch of fish. Uh, and they brought the fish in, and Peter comes to the feet of Jesus, and he, and he gets down, the Bible says, uh, down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O God. Peter saw it in that moment. He saw who he was compared to God, and, and noticed the great distance between the two. Simon here in this part of the passage presumes his perfection. Man, he's... He's being schooled. <laughs> Jesus is teaching him something, but he's unteachable because he believes he's right. Obviously, he might say there's a great distance. You know, I'm not God, but pretty close. And sometimes we think the same things, don't we? Man, I, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not, I, I know I have sin. I remember I lied once in fourth grade, and I, you know, I yelled at my you know, husband. Like, uh, but, 
but basically I'm pretty good. And my friend, if that's the attitude, oh, we need to beg God to let the gospel grow in our life so that we can discover the distance between God and me. God is holy. It means he's in a class all by himself. He's the, he's the valedictorian, and we're not the salutatorian. We don't graduate with honors. We're at the bottom of the class as far away as can be. In the book of Malachi, we see the Israelites are asked questions by God. And they, they think less of God and more of themselves, just like Simon. Five times in the book of Malachi, Jesus or God asks a question like this question. He says, "Wherein have we dis- uh, have?" Or he says, "You've despised me." Excuse me. And he says, "Wherein have we despised you? You've polluted me." And and then they respond in their arrogance, "Where have we polluted you? you? You wearied me. Where have we wearied you? What what?" And, and they think less of God and more. You've robbed God, he said in Malachi. And they said, wherein have we robbed God? And tithes and offerings. Uh, what was the response? Self-righteous people. Whether they go to church every week or whether they don't, they think less of God and more of themselves than they should. Number three, self-righteousness desires to be worshipped and not to worship. In verse 44, we see how this woman, <clears throat> and Jesus turns to the woman and says to Simon, Simon, I came in, and you didn't wash my feet. She did. Uh, Simon, I, I came in, uh, and, you, and you didn't anoint my, uh, you didn't kiss me, you didn't greet me with a kiss, and she's kissed my feet. You didn't give me any oil, you didn't help me freshen up, and she did these wonderful expressions of love, this expression of worship. Where was Simon? Where was his, why did he miss the opportunity to express his gratitude to Jesus, who he was? to show his appreciation, to show his love and dedication uh, and, and commitment to him. The fact is, is Simon's in his own head. Simon's world revolves around himself and, and doing a bunch of good things to get the recognition. The, this lady uh, did all the things right uh, and she, because she knew her correct worth compared to Christ. It was nothing and she came in worshiping. Simon did not. Simon didn't even recognize Jesus as somebody important or valuable. Because Simon was more consumed about himself being noticed, recognized, being significant in the eyes of people. He's like a Pharisee from Matthew 6, 1, where Jesus says, when you do your alms, when you give money in the offering, don't sound the trumpet. Don't toot your own horn, uh, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Why? That they may have glory of men. That they may be worshipped of men. He says that they have the reward. Jesus says, when you understand who you really are and what your works are all about, don't do them to be glorified of men. Do them just to be seen of God. Do them because you love God, and God who sees you in secret will reward you openly. Our only hope out of this brokenness, out of this self-righteousness, is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. It's not about, we don't deserve to be worshipped. The Bible says that Jesus had to become sin for us, the one who knew no sin, so that we could be made right with God. It's not about the series of correct activities that I do. It's not about the movies that I don't watch. It's not about the places that I go or don't go. It's all by the grace of God. Now, should there be things we don't watch? Yes. Should there be places we don't go? Yes. Should there be places we do go? Yes. But that is an expression of my love for God and what Jesus Christ has done for me through the cross. Jeremiah 9, 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. If you're going to glory, glory in the fact that you know God. Glory in the fact that God is righteous. Glory in the fact that he uh, executes correct judgment, that he is loving uh, and kind. Self-righteousness desires to be seen, to be worshipped, rather than to worship. Number four, self-righteousness loves God less because they don't see the distance between them and God. It loves God less because they don't see the distance between them and God. He said, Simon, her sins were many. They're forgiven, for she loved much. It's evidenced by her much love for me. But to whom little is forgiven... The same loveth little. Simon didn't love God that much. Simon didn't love Jesus that much because he didn't need Jesus, because he thought he was perfect, because he thought he had arrived. And I think many times as Christians, uh, we were saved 10 years ago, saved 20 years ago, and man, we've, God has changed our life and done huge things in our life. We wouldn't totally discount them, but the truth is where we sit today, we kind of think, man, 
I've got it all together. What's that guy's problem? What's their problem? Man, look at me. Look at what I'm doing. Wait, why aren't people noticing what I'm doing? How good I am at all of this stuff. Where's the credit? Where's the recognition? Where's the pomp? Where's the, where's the circumstance? And, and, and what happens in that, because when we live our Christian life, we're thinking, man, I'm good uh, that we want to be noticed. We want to be worshipped. Really what ends up happening is we begin to love God less because we think it's about us instead of God. As we grow in the gospel, though, so does my love and appreciation for Jesus. His mediation, His sacrifice, His righteousness, His gracious works on my behalf, they become sweeter and sweeter. It's like that child who grows up and goes, oh, now I see what my dad was doing. Now I see what my mom meant. Now I get it. And that should be what's happening to us where we go, oh, Man, I am sin. Man, I thought I was this way, but I am not that good. Man, I thought, I was, man, that is wrong. That is, if, if we define sin by just the narrow little list of things that we find acceptable or that our friends find acceptable, sure, we might be able to manage that and do all that. But when we understand that in the gospel, sin is any time uh, that we desire anything other than God. Man, that happens all the time, a hundred thousand times a day in my life and in your life. We begin to see, I am so sinful. When we complain and we doubt the goodness of God and we grumble and, and moan and we don't like what happened or how we're treated and we oh, have an attitude and we experience those uh, emotional warning signs. It's evidence that we're sinning. It's evidence that we're getting ready to go to a place where we're trying to get our own needs met outside of God, just like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Self-righteousness loves God less because we think that we're good enough, because we think that we have it all together and we need to define our sin correctly. Here's these... Gospel circles, you know these, don't you? God's design, brokenness, the gospel. Uh, if we could zoom in to that gospel circle, we're going to come to a new picture for you. I, I know you're tired of those circles and, and arrows. We've added some to uh, that will be a, a help to you. We, when we uh, are saved, uh, we, at the moment of salvation, this new picture shows us that dot kind of represents salvation. What happens there is we begin to be aware of the distance between God and man, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. For the wages of sin is death. Uh, and there's none that doeth good. There's none that seeketh good. I, I'm not perfect. I don't measure up. I can't work my way in. There's a distance. But as the gospel grows in our life, and that's uh, referenced by these crosses that are growing on that picture, uh, so does our awareness of God's holiness and my flesh and my sinfulness. There's a, there, I am aware of the distance between God's holiness and my sinfulness. And that's, that's how it should be. That's what should be happening today, right now, where some way the Holy Spirit is saying, see? And we go, man, I did it again. Man, I'm so sinful. Man, I'm so wrong. God is just so transcendent. He's in a class all of his own. I just, I just could never measure up. That is supposed to be the correct response to the to preaching and teaching of God's word. Not, oh good, I got this list, now I'll go out and do it. All right, okay, here we go. No, it, it should be, we come to a place where we go, oh man, I'm poor in spirit, I'm bankrupt, I can't do this, I need help, I need a savior, not just for the past, not just for the future, but also for right now. But you know, the truth is, sometimes in our life, uh, as evidenced by this next picture, we minimize the cross, we minimize the gospel. It doesn't grow in our life. It's not much more. We don't understand much more about it. We don't live in the victory of it much more than we did the moment we got saved. And so when we do, it's not that our sinfulness changes or that God's holiness changes. It's that our awareness of it changes. And so on the holiness side, we perform, do the list, check the boxes, and it gives us a false sense of, of, of us measuring up to closer to God's, God's holiness. That's not true. Uh, on the other end, we pretend like we're not that bad. Oh, I'd never do that. I'd never act like that. I would never, at least I didn't. Uh, and we pretend uh, like we're not that sinful, that we can have it all together. And it shrinks. It minimizes the gospel. It minimizes the grace of God. It min minimizes the miraculous work that Jesus Christ did for you and me on the cross. And somehow it, it worships ourself instead of giving all the credit and all the praise to God. We must fight this, and we're going to look at this a few uh, more in, in depth in the next few weeks. We must fight this 
by constantly nourishing our minds with biblical truth. We're designed to glorify God. And we don't just, we don't just nourish our minds with biblical truth just because, oh, I've got to read my Bible, I've got to pray, I've got to go to church, I've got to do the things that a good Christian does. No, we're designed to, to glorify God. We were designed uh, to experience joy and peace and pleasure and fulfillment in Jesus Christ, in the sufficiency of God. And so we fill our mind with that truth that would help us to live there in that place. We don't want to stand in our smug, pretend righteousness. But when we get a glimpse of God's holiness through the display, through his displayed glory of the gospel, we begin to see the distance. And it should cause us to worship. It should cause us to be thankful. It should cause us to love God more than we ever have. And that love, not to grow less and less over time, but to deepen. I remember when I was in college, God gave me a great friend. His name was Kevin. Kevin uh, was a big influence in my life, and he was a little older than I was. He'd been living for God longer than I had, but Kevin was saved when he was in college. Uh, and I was saved when I was 12. I lived in a pastor's home. I, I was very sheltered uh, as a child growing up. There's a lot of things I still haven't done, and that's to the credit of my parents and the grace of God. Nothing to do with me. I wasn't allowed to. That wasn't Kevin's story. That's not the way Kevin grew up. And I can remember as we were friends, we'd go to church, and we'd uh, sit in service, we'd do other things. Uh, and just in his everyday life, it was clearly apparent that he was just so grateful for God, and so grateful for salvation. And, and I was thankful, I was appreciative, I was grateful. But the intensity of that thankfulness, the love and the connection and the relationship with God that Kevin had, I just, I just wasn't there. And there's a number of reasons why that was, but I remember one of the times in college, I, I read this story, Luke 7. And I thought about this, that says, to whom much is forgiven, there's much love, but whom little is forgiven, there's little love. And I thought, well, man, I, I, I thought about Kevin and I, I said, that must be why Kevin loves God so much more, because Kevin was really bad. Kevin was, was just a real big sinner uh, before he got saved, and I was just a little sinner. And so Jesus died for me on the cross, but he didn't have to die for that much compared to Kevin. And so, man, I'm sort of, sort of stuck here in this place the rest of my life. I, maybe I should have went out and sinned more so that I could love God more. Now, I hope you hear all the self-righteousness kind of dripping and oozing off of that statement and off of that story. Because the point that the Bible is making isn't that for those who have been really bad, you're going to love God more. And those of us who are pretty good, uh, we just love God, but it just will never be as deep as people who have been saved out of a life of crime and wickedness and uh, all the sinfulness. That, that's that's self-righteousness. Well, what the point that, that God is trying to make and the point that Jesus is trying to teach to Simon is, Simon, you're just as bad as her. You're just as big a sinner as her. The, the fact is, though, is you don't see your sin. You think you're okay. You think you're whole. You think you're not sick, and so you don't need a physician. You think that all you're doing and all your effort somehow is undoing the sinful person you are. You've redefined sin to fit your life so that you can be good at it and succeed. But it's not how God defines sin. It's not how the Bible describes wickedness. You've classified these different kinds of wickedness uh, and, you, and you've excused yours. The point was is that he wanted Simon to see his sinfulness. And my friend, this is what happens when we grow in the gospel. We begin to discover the distance between us and God. You know, the truth is, I look at my life today, and by God's grace through the gospel, I sin more than I've ever sinned. Because I realize that sin isn't just watching a bad movie. But sin is any time I desire anything other than God. Any time I grumble at the provision of what God has given to me. Any time I think that I need more than God in my life and I go away. I just like Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They thought they needed more than God. My friends, I sin so much I couldn't keep track in a day. And so do you. And so the point isn't uh, that we would do X, Y, Z in religion, X, Y, Z in church, and man, we're pretty good. And uh, No, the, the point is to recognize, to grow in the gospel, become aware uh, of the distance between us and God, to see Him for who He truly is. And, and look, that doesn't leave us going, oh man, I'm a loser. Man, I blew it again. I can I could never measure up to God. That's not the point. That, well, that is true, but that's not how we leave. Here, here, here's where we should leave. It's like, man, I was way down here. 
I was worse than I thought I was. I was farther away than I ever could imagine. And yet, God loved me. While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. Man, that makes what Jesus did on the cross even more incredible because I realized how far down I was gone, how lost I was, how deep in the hole that I was. And Jesus pulled my feet out of the miry clay and set it on a rock. He saved my soul. He forgave my sins. All of them. Our love for God grows when the gospel grows. If we live in self-righteousness, we don't see it. That's why Paul prays in Ephesians chapter 1, and he prays in verse 18, he says, I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of his glory, the inheritance in the, in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ. Paul's praying, oh, I pray that it, you see it. I pray that you understand. I pray that you grow in the knowledge and understanding of who God is and who you are. Of the gospel, that that cross, uh, the gospel grows bigger in your life so you become more aware of who you are and who he is. And, and, and what it results in is not going, oh, I'm a loser. But it results in saying, man, I love Jesus. He died for me. He saved me. He forgave me. I was the worst of sinners. I was the wretched man. I was undone. I was a man of unclean lips. And God save my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that we can grow in the gospel. Praise the Lord that we can see the distance and that Jesus Christ bridged that distance for you and me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. May we grow in it. May we become more aware every day of the distance between us and the gap that you spanned, that you condescended to us to love us and to die for us, and to be buried and raised, raised again so that we can have this victory in our life. We praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here for our service today. Uh, we trust that this was a blessing to you and an encouragement as you go into the week ahead. I want to encourage you, if the Lord spoke to your heart today uh, during the message and you made a decision for Christ, uh, go ahead and fill out our Next Steps card. That link is in the comments right now. Uh, just let us know that you made a decision uh, so that we can encourage you as you follow the Lord and take your next steps in your faith uh, in God. I also want to encourage you, if you're not a part of a city group, uh, to, to look into that. We've, we've actually had record attendance in our city groups the last few weeks, um, and we've been meeting on, on a continuing basis uh, through Zoom and uh, encouraging one another and bearing each other's burdens and praying for one another through this time. So if you haven't joined a city group yet or you're not connected with one, uh, there's a link in the description of this video where you can go and find out more information. Uh, and we would love to have you be a part of one of our city groups that meet throughout the week. Thank you again for being with us today. Uh, we trust that you have a great week ahead and we'll see you next time.